Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very empowering show coming right up with special guest, Dr. John Chuback, and he's here to share with us his new book, Make Your Own Damn Cheese, Understanding, Navigating, and Mastering the Three Mazes of Success. Dr. Chuback is board certified in general surgery and cardiovascular surgery. He received his MD from Rutgers University and has been in private practice for 16 years. He's also a successful entrepreneur, founder, and chief medical officer at Chuback Medical Group. He's a recipient of the Patient's Choice Award and Compassionate Doctor Recognition, among many other honors. Dr. Chuback also founded Chuback Education, which offers audio programs on subjects like weight management, smoking cessation, personal development, and academic achievement. So let's welcome to the show, Dr. John Chuback. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about your new book. I I love this book. Once I picked it up, I could not put it down. Well, I, it's it's short enough that it can be read in one sitting fairly easily. It might take someone a couple of hours in that in that neighborhood, but I always um I always ask people if they like the book to, you know, maybe read it two or three times cuz for a small book, there's quite a bit in there, and I think that it's helpful to kind of let it sink sink in and go over it a couple of times. Well, and this title is very similar to other another book that's out there, and I'd love for you to share with our listeners the inspiration behind this book. Well, the book you're referring to is uh, Who Moved My Cheese? And there's no uh, mistake about it. The, the title is related. And Who Moved My Cheese was written by another physician named Spencer Johnson, who's unfortunately no longer with us. But I found that book to be very inspirational at a point in my career where I was making a change in direction, pivoting from open heart surgery to what I do now, which is office-based, laser-based treatment of um, venous disease and varicose veins and problems with with the venous system of the circulation. And I found Dr. Johnson's book very um, motivational, and I got a lot of support from that book, which basically was sharing the message that it's okay to go in a new direction. Well, I'm so glad you shared that with us, because I think a lot of times people get into these positions in life where they're following a course, and then they may think, gosh, you know, why am I even doing this? Right. And, you know, I think the essence of Dr. Johnson's book, Who Moved My Cheese, which I recommend everybody uh, to read. I I, I don't know that he needs my my, uh, testimonial uh, because they sold, I think, somewhere between 30 and 50 million copies of that book in numerous languages. But I think the essence of his book was to say that, you know, the world that we live in is sort of like a maze and it's complicated and there are many pathways and there are dead ends and there are some shortcuts, but the the essence was that someone else outside of ourselves was in control of the so-called cheese, which was, in his book, I think, a metaphor generally for financial success, maybe professional success, et cetera, and that one needed to be dynamic and adventurous and curious and willing to change in order to continue to do well and succeed in their life. And and I thought it was a phenomenal message. It used this this little metaphor of these of mice in a maze. It was simple to read. It was fast. And I I really got a lot out of it. It, it had a big impact on me as I was making this major career change um, from major off uh, excuse me, hospital based open heart surgery to um, elective office based surgery. And it really gave me the confidence that what I was doing was was the right thing and that it was okay and that I should follow my heart and that I should be willing to make that change. Well, and I think for a lot of people, that can be a really scary decision to make. And your book gives them permission that it's okay to follow your heart and make changes in your life. Yeah, and that's, I think that was sort of what I wanted to add to the conversation. I felt that I did have something to add. It was almost 20 years from the time I had read the, the original book 
until the time I read my book. And the thing that I wanted to add was that you don't only have to be dependent on these quote unquote outsiders who are moving the cheese around and that you should spend your life or career chasing the cheese wherever they put it, that you have this capacity to quote unquote, make your own damn cheese. One of the things I've come to believe, you know, from a spiritual point of view, if you will, is that we're here as co-creators, that we have the capacity as human beings, unlike any other animal that known in the universe, we have the ability to create and to use our imagination as a jumping off point to create our own reality. And we don't always have to be chasing the cheese as set out by someone else. We can create our own quote unquote cheese factory. Well, to kind of dovetail with that, I know you talk about happiness and satisfaction. Are those the same thing? No, it's a great, it's a great question. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, You know, from childhood, and it's important to talk about the the child's mind, okay, because we're all children at, at heart, and we all start as children. And what's interesting is that the mind of the child, not not the brain, the brain is a physical organ, but the mind is more of an activity. The subconscious mind of a child up until, let's say, the age six or seven is wide open, and it can only accept what's put put into it. The subconscious mind has no ability to accept or or reject it only accepts it's not a thinking mind it is um it is like a fertile garden with fertile soil whatever you plant there will grow and the reason i bring that up is because when it comes to this idea of satisfaction and being satisfied i think all of us were raised hearing aphorisms like you should learn to be satisfied. And when are you going to learn to be satisfied? When is enough enough for you? John, when are you going to learn to be satisfied? It's, it seems to never be enough for you. And it, it was always an admonishment. It was always some sort of a negative um, connotation associated with with those admonitions that by being dissatisfied, you were somehow bad. You know, essentially, you're a bad person and that you should learn to be satisfied if you wanted to be good. Be satisfied with you with what you have. What I've come to learn through many years of, of uh, personal development study and a lot of reading and a lot of introspection is that dissatisfaction is a creative state. It's one thing to be happy. We should all be happy. Happiness is a, is a phenomenal goal. We should really work to be happy every day of our life. But to be happy is different than being satisfied. As I said, dissatisfaction is a creative state. So I like to give examples of, you know, some of the pioneers of American industry. Um, Let's say the Wright brothers. These were two bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, with no formal education. At their disposal, they had only the tools and materials in their shop, in their bicycle repair shop in Dayton. But somehow they became dissatisfied with automotive traffic or or travel, horse and buggy travel, horseback travel, travel over the water by boat, bicycle travel. They had their minds much higher than that, high in the sky, as envisioning themselves as pilots of mechanized flying machines, of airplanes. And they had no right to think that way. They had no right whatsoever to have such lofty, ambitious goals for themselves. But for whatever reason, thank goodness, they did. They did feel that way. And they let their dissatisfaction be a source of tremendous creativity. And that tremendous creativity, where they risk their lives building these machines and and risk their business, they traveled halfway across the country to get to Kitty Hawk and so on and so forth. That dissatisfaction has had such a major impact on the rest of the world, on all of humanity, on our daily lives, our ability to travel, our ability to explore the world, our ability to get places conveniently and safely. 
And it all came from the dissatisfaction of Orville and Wilbur Wright, two individuals, which I think is quite amazing. And I never read anything. I've read biographies about them and so on and so forth. I've watched documentaries about them. I've never read anything or seen anything to imply that they were ever unhappy, but they were obviously dissatisfied. So I think it's a really, really um, important distinction to understand. That is such a great example. I'm so glad you shared that with us because when you look at if people end up just becoming satisfied in their lives in different ways, how much we miss out on, you know, there's so many miracles we're missing out on if they look at this and go, you know what, I can do better or this can be better. Well, you touch on another one of my favorite words, which is better. I think better is such a beautiful word because everyone can get better, no matter how well you're doing or how poorly you're doing in any facet of your life. And we have so many different facets, personal relationships, personal health, fitness, happiness, financial, um, professional. Everyone, no matter where they are at this moment, can do better. And I think it's a great aspiration for everyone to have. And in order to want to do better, you have to be a little bit dissatisfied in one area or another. Isn't that the truth? (laughs) Well, and so to kind of touch on that, you talked about you know, a word that you liked. Are there other words that you particularly like? Well, there there are. There are there are pairs of words and groups of words that I find interesting because they're often used synonymously and they're not synonymous. So for example, we've touched on a couple like happiness and satisfaction. Those are often used interchangeably, but they're they're not interchangeable in my in my opinion. And in addition to that group, I like to add the word fun. Fun and happiness are two different things. You can be happy at work because you're doing something of importance. You're fulfilling certain goals and certain um, tasks and requirements. So you can feel happiness in the achievement of your work. But that doesn't mean it's always going to be fun. I can assure you as an open heart surgeon, there's a tremendous amount of happiness and uh, fulfillment that comes from doing a quadruple bypass, let's say, and getting a patient through a five or six hour surgery um, and home in, in three or four days. But the process isn't exactly fun. So when people have false expectations that, that everything that makes you happy should be fun, it's it's going to lead to a lot of disappointment. Fun is for parties. It's for special occasions. And those are moments. But happiness is something that is more, I think, transcendent and more long-term. Fun is more spontaneous and, and fleeting. So that would be one one other example um, that I like to talk about. The, the other one that I like to talk about, a word that I enjoy is the word responsibility. And I like to think of it as one's ability to respond to difficult or demanding or trying circumstances and situations in a capable way, your ability to respond. So the, let's say, surgeon should be a responsible individual, not for the moments when surgery is going well, anybody can handle that, but for the moments where things get difficult, where there may be unexpected or unwanted bleeding or a complication of some sort, how does the individual respond to the pressure and the stress of those situations? Like the airline pilot, for example, or the um, locomotive uh, engineer. It's, It's your ability to cope with life's more difficult moments successfully and professionally so that you hopefully have a good a good outcome. So I love that word responsibility. I don't think it's a word that we hear enough of in sort of current language. I would agree. I think most people, when they hear that word, they think work and like, ooh, I don't want to add any more work to my plate. Yeah, it's true. And, uh, you know, I, I have a, a joke that, you know, work is a four letter word and it is, but it's, it's also, you know, it's a, it's a terrific work without, without work, 
there's no production and without production there's there's no advancement and, and things don't get better so everything that we see around us in the physical world the cell phone the the laptop computer um 747s etc are the manifestation of uh, an individual or groups work and it all begins in this amazing, incredible mind that we've been blessed with and in the human imagination. And that's, that's one other example I, I'd like to talk about, which is the word imagination versus the word creativity. Again, often used synonymously, and they have a very, I think, um, slight but important difference. You may say, oh, you know, John is a very imaginative person. He's so imaginative, so creative. But if I've never actually created anything, then I'm not creative. I may have all kinds of ideas. You know, I had this idea. I want to start an ice cream shop with uh, 31 flavors and so on and so forth. Oh, really? Where is your shop? Oh, no, I don't have a shop, but I had this idea. You know, in my imagination, I could see it. You know, it's amazing. We're only going to use organic products and we're going to only use recyclable cartons. And oh, it's a phenomenal idea. But that individual may not bring it to fruition. You have the other individual who's both imaginative, imaginative and creative. In other words, I'm sure many people over the millennia imagined flying in a machine, but it really took the Wright brothers to create that reality, which takes a lot of work, which was the key word in this, you know, discussion. To to go from the imagination, which is vivid and beautiful and you know just extraordinary in its own right, to the material world, the the creation of something that actually exists in the physical realm, that process of what we call, and I talk about that in the book, transmutation requires work. And so for that beautiful process to occur, then the work must be the beautiful tool necessary to bring it uh, forth. Well, and so when we look at this and we step back and we, we you know, envision the maze that people are living in, what are some ways they can first recognize that and then get out of the maze? Well, what I, what I like to say in the book, or the, the, I think the message I bring across is that there's good news and bad news, uh, in a sense. The bad news is you can never escape the maze. The maze is reality. The maze is the world we live in. Um, now, people try to escape the maze through um, drugs and alcohol and, um, in some extreme cases, sadly, suicide and things like that. But the, the maze is our world. So there's no escaping the maze. But the good news is you can reconfigure the maze to be the maze that you wish to live in, the maze of your dreams. And in the book, I I refer to a, a concept or a process known as blue sky thinking. And blue sky thinking is when one says to oneself, if my life were exactly the way that I wanted it to be, how would it look? Where would I live? Who would I spend my time with? What kind of work would I do? How much money would I earn? How much money would I have saved? Where would I vacation? How would I vacation? Do I travel first class? Do I travel in coach? Do I travel on a private jet? Do I own a private jet? Do I take the bus? Each and every one of these concepts makes up your vision for your own life. There's no right or wrong answer. You might find it more exhilarating to uh, hitchhike from here to Los Angeles than to fly in a private jet. But be honest with yourself, be true to yourself, and live the life that you envision in that blue sky kind of vision. So often we come up short, not because we can't achieve it, but because we won't even allow ourselves to think that way. Going back again to the childhood experience where everyone says, when are you going to be satisfied? Who flies on a private jet? Who who sits in first class? Those people don't pay for those tickets. Those are paid for corporate or they got um, moved up or they you know were bumped off of another flight. 
all these kinds of crazy ideas that we grow up with. And as a child, it takes root in your subconscious mind and you believe these ideas and then you eliminate from your consciousness that I should ever fly first class or on a private jet or own a jet or that I should ever hitchhike anywhere for, for, for that matter. We, we adopt the beliefs of those people around us, assuming they know what they're doing. And that's a very dangerous assumption. That's one of my favorite concepts is that we watch people around us and they're all doing things about the same way. So we assume that must be the right way to do it. When in fact, that turns out to be the average way. So if you want to be average, that's a great way to start. Do what most of the people around you are doing. But if you want to be exceptional, which is not an ego trip or some arrogant you know, kind of uh, attitude or behavior, it's just being an exception to the rule. Listen, 90% of the people sit in the back of the plane, 10% sit in the front. They're the exception. I'd like to sit up here where the seats are bigger and the service is better. Make me a bad person? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <I> mean, <clears throat> and that's I what makes so. the world such a great place because we have such diversity. Correct. And it's what makes America such an exceptionally great place because we have opportunity and choice and chance to do that. There are places in the world, make no mistake about it, where I could discuss all these ideas until I'm blue in the face, but I don't think the people in North Korea have the opportunity to really manifest any of these ideas, unfortunately, at this, at this time. But in a country like ours, I mean, just about anybody can start from the bottom and do better. I don't know that everybody can make it to the top, but you can do better. You can always do a little bit better if you believe that. And if you believe in yourself, you know, it, it's one other term that I love so much, self-esteem. Okay. Self-esteem basically means how much do I like myself? I mean, this is a problem that people struggle with. I'm a physician. I see people every day in my office. If, if, if I could put self-esteem in uh, a syringe and inject it into people's backsides, I would. Because without self-esteem, it's very, very difficult to achieve anything close to what your potential is. And with self-esteem, you have a much, much better chance of succeeding at just about anything that you try. Yeah, it's not the truth because it really is what makes the difference. When you know, People like to follow people who have self-esteem, who feel like they're confident about what they're doing. Right. Well, again, in my primary uh, profession as a surgeon, <clears throat> imagine if you're a patient and you come in my office and now there's a fine line. No one likes someone who's arrogant. That's always a negative vibe that's given off. It's always a turn off. And that's not, that's not uh, fruitful or valuable to be arrogant. But if you come to see a surgeon who doesn't appear to exude sincere, natural um, self-confidence, authentic self-confidence, who wants that person to do their operation if their life is on the line? So, so or, or a pilot. I mean, we, we all, you know, I'm a surgeon. I go to the airport. I see the pilots coming through. They're beautifully dressed. They have their jacket pressed. They always have a nice, neat haircut. The guy or gal appears to have their, you know, stuff together. Mm -hmm. They're fit. They're, 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 they're groomed. They look professional. I, I have no idea whether they're not a fly an airplane, but their appearance and the self-esteem that they are um, uh, portraying or exuding or displaying gives me a sense of calm as a passenger on the plane. Yeah. If you had, you know, either a doctor or, or a pilot saying, oops, I think a lot of people would really take notice to that. Yeah, you don't want to be saying you don't want to be saying oops either outside loud or even or even in your head, but it is a it's a it's a role that individuals in positions of responsibility play, but it's a role that every single one of us can play in our own lives. How do I feel about myself? How much do I believe in myself? How much do I believe in my my um real potential. And self-esteem is another one of those terms that lies closely to another important um, phrase, which is 
self-concept, and we talk a lot about that in Make Your Own Damn Cheese, the self-concept is basically what I describe in the book as being the paradigm. And what is that? It is a collection of beliefs that largely, almost exclusively, dictate and mandate how we behave. And our habitual behavior, especially, and it turns out that the vast majority of our behaviors are habitual. If you're uh, married or living with someone, you have a significant other, you know that in the morning, that person has a routine. And if you're smart, you stay out of their way. You don't, you don't get in the way of their routine. And you have your routine. And that begins from the moment the alarm clock goes on to the moment that you bathe and dress and uh, put your, um, your work belongings together and get in the car and stop for your coffee here and they stop for their coffee there. Whatever it is, so much of what we do is habitual. And that's being driven by the self-concept, the belief in who we are. So am I driving to the unemployment office or am I driving to the, to the hospital to do an operation? What determines the vast majority of that is my self-concept that I grew up with, that I believed in, that I fell in love with, the way I see myself in the world. The good news is that we have lots of different aspects to our personality, to our persona. One is employment, one is wealth, one is fitness, et cetera, et cetera. You may have nine out of 10 things right on, spot on, and you, and you love those components of your life. The good news with this, with this book and this philosophy is that the areas that you don't like, you don't have to be a complete failure to have change that you want to make. There may be one or two areas that you don't like by understanding the material in this book, you, you begin to understand that we become what we think about. And if I want to change my relationship status, or I want to change my fitness status, if I want to change my blood pressure, if I want to change my income, I have the power to do that. If I've been led to believe that I'm just a mouse in the maze and the, ma the cheese is being placed by someone else and I have to scurry around searching for where they put the cheese... I'm always the victim in this in this game. Even if I successfully find the cheese, I much prefer the idea of, hey, why don't we each create our own individual cheese factory and manufacture, produce our own success in these various areas of our lives? Because we have the ability to do so as human beings. It's a great gift. That's one of the reasons I found your book to be so empowering is that it gives people a new perspective on life and how they can move forward. And my goodness, we could talk all day, Dr. Kachubak, in regards to this book. I'd love for you to share a little bit about, I know you have Chewback Education. I'd love for you to share a little bit about what that is. Well, Chewback Education is a company that I started a few years ago. And it, to be quite honest, it's still really very much in its infancy. It's something I'm passionate about. It's something that's growing. The publication and distribution nationwide of this book will be a um, very important component of its growth and success because as I'm getting more exposure, uh, thanks to people like yourself having me on their shows and writing articles about me and so forth, people are becoming aware of the the work that I do and the message that I share and the material that I teach. And what I'd really like to see, um, hopefully in the not too distant future, would be a series of live seminars where people could come out and see me and I could teach and go through this material with them um, in person, where I think it's even more powerful. And I have really a lot to share on, on this subject of personal development. So that, that still remains a, a goal and a dream of mine. We, sh we all have goals and aspirations. And for me, that's still a little bit out on the horizon, but I think I'm getting closer and closer all the time. Well, I'm glad that you are because there's so much great information in this simple to read small book. And I think people walk away kind of feeling really empowered just by having it. Well, thanks. That means a lot to me. And for a friend of mine who is a very successful uh, business person in Manhattan was traveling on business last night, and he called me from Seattle. He was delayed in the airport, 
And he said, he said, I'm sitting here reading your book again. He said, but I'm going to buy another one because I'm going to leave this here in the lounge, hoping somebody else will pick it up and benefit from it. So I said, Peter, I said, that's wonderful. I said, I, I appreciate it. I said, I'll send you a signed copy. So, so I thought that that was, was a nice thing that people do, do appreciate the message and are, you know, um, resonating with it and um, are eager to share it actually. Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Chupak, where can people connect with you and be part of your community? They can find me at ChewbackEducation.com as that site continues to grow. Hopefully there'll be um, announcements about um, events and seminars that will be taking place in the, in the near future. They can also find me on social media on Facebook at Chewback Education and on Instagram, uh, John Chewback MD. So um, we're always posting. We try to post inspirational memes and quotes of the day and things like that, um, videos and as much as much free content as we can possibly get out there to just you know share this message, share this material, because I feel there's no one um, in any walk of life who couldn't benefit. I I've been studying it for 20 years. Uh, certainly not all the ideas are mine. I, I may um, put them in my own way, but um, there are no new fundamentals. And I'm just trying to be, you know, part of the, the system that passes it along and pays it forward and just keeps on shining. Well, Dr. Chuback, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. It's been my pleasure. It's a real treat. I really appreciate your time. Well, Dr. Chuback, it's been such an honor to spend this time with you and, of course, to talk about your new book, Make Your Own Damn Cheese. Again, if you'd like to connect with Dr. Chuback, you can at ChewbackEducation.com. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.